specifically uh, Vona Voices panel. And Vona Voices is a workshop for writers of color. <laughs> Thank you, we have some Vona fans in the audience. One of the ones we're proposing for the Bay Area is this one in particular, The Shifting Neighborhood. I was looking at some headline as I was passing the newspaper box. You know how you look at the headline, okay? I was looking at the headline and it says, uproar over neighborhood transition in Los Angeles. And I was thinking transition. What a sweet word for taking over people's property, raising the rent, and creating exiles in the city that people come from or have lived in for a long time. This has become a really popular topic right now. But for writers of color and people from First Nations, it's been a topic our entire life. We come from occupied, uh, disrupted communities, and the more we create our, or solidly create our places, the more we're under threat of losing them, especially in these kind of aggressive economies that are happening right now. So one of the reasons I invited these authors is we have been talking about these shifts in our writing, not just in this recent economy, but for years. And so today we're going to read a little bit about it, talk a lot about it, and later on have a great discussion about it. I've given you some great opportunity to be with these amazing writers, and I'd love to introduce them to you right now. Right here is Carolina de Roberto, right up here Robertus, um, Karen Te Yamashita, and Naomi Munawera. So say hi to the writers. The way we're going to introduce each of the writers is they're going to read a little piece of their work that's going to help generate some of the ideas about the um, discussion that we're going to have in the remaining part of the hour. So I'd like to ask Carolina to begin and take it away. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, it's such a thrill to, an honor to be here. I am not a Vona alum, but my wife is a Vona alum, as are so very many of my friends. I'm a huge longtime fan, so I'm so excited to be here representing in this way. And um, I am going to read from my third novel, which comes out next month, but I just got this copy in the mail two days ago, so I can sort of hold it. <laughs> it's very exciting. <laughs> so I'm going to read for it. And, um, so I'm going to read from, this is a historical work about the early days of the formation of the music we now know as the dangle, um, in the waves of migration, mostly from Europe, that came to Buenos Aires and Uruguay, um, my nation of origin, um, in, in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, whose culture combined with the people who were already there, um, among them descendants of enslaved people from Africa, who made tremendous um, contributions to the development of the tango and of Argentinian and Uruguayan culture and who are completely invisible in, this, in the sort of like main narratives of the countries. So this uh, is a displacement uh, that happened in a city 100 years ago, but I hope that it'll have some relevance for our contemporary conversations about our Bay Area cities. A music born among the children of slaves is like an orphan. It will never know its real parents, will never hear the full visceral story of its birth. That's what his uncle Palo had told him. Palo used to drum when Santiago was a boy, every night after dinner and for hours on Sundays, on drawers turned upside down, on barrels salvaged from the port, drumming as if the slap of palms on hard things could fill his children's bellies for the night, though it could not as if the dead gathered in a circle around him, listening and reveling and stepping in time. And there were so many dead. Palo's three older brothers had died in the Paraguayan War, conscripted by the Argentinian government, taken off by force along with all the black men of their generation because, Palo told young Santiago, they needed a way to not only win their war but also rid this country of us in the process two birds with one stone. Buenos Aires was too black for them, one third of the population. That's enough blackness to swallow you up, to get strong on you. And so they sent our fathers off to war and opened floodgates to European steamships so that white men would pour into the city to replace us. And their plan worked, the bastards, 
Look at our city now. Look at San Telmo. It's like an outpost of Italy around here. Not that I'm complaining. Your father was a good man, and if he hadn't come here from Florence, he wouldn't have met my sister, and you wouldn't have been born. History is dirty, but you're a good thing to come out of it, one of the best. to be with you, and thank you for being here. Um, this book, I Hotel, is a novel about the Asian American movement uh, as it was organized in the 1960s and 70s um, here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And it's centered about the International Hotel in San Francisco, also known as the I Hotel, which was a site of community activism and protest to prevent the destruction of the hotel which was the home of elderly Chinese and Filipino bachelors at the very end of their laboring lives. I thought it might be useful to think about the nature of the hotel historically and the hotel's relationship to the formation of the city. So I'm going to read a little piece of that. If we remember the history of our city, we would remember how frontier towns began with the trading post and a saloon with a second floor of lodging rooms. In time, we saw erected a jail with our troublemakers, a courthouse with our records, and a bank with our money. The trading post became a dry goods store, and the saloon a restaurant and hotel. That was our basic city. This basic town, or that was our basic town, this basic town got complicated and multiplied into a thing we call the city. With every kind of reinvented trading post and saloon and lodging that over time we could imagine. And we suppose that the history of any city could be told through the coming and goings of any trading post or saloon. <coughs> but thinking as we do as people coming to the city to find work to pay for shelter and board, whether just for ourselves or for our families, accompanying or left behind, it was the lodging that most concerned us. And we could see how city life and hotel life were inextricably connected, that what the city had to offer had a home in the hotel. Over time, we'd forgotten that hotels in our city have long served as temporary but also permanent homes, that living in hotels had been the normal consequence of living in our city. From the inception of our city, our city life could perhaps be translated as hotel life, the way that we as young, single, and independent people could arrive to find work in the industry of the city, find the small cafes and bars, theaters, and social clubs, laundry shops, and bookstores, all within walking distance or perhaps a cable stop away. Even if we did not actually live in hotels, we may have participated in, if not considered, the simple luxuries of hotel life, the bustling social life of our streets, the hotels, communal restaurants, and social galas, the convenience of maid servants and bed sheets changed, the possibility of being completely free from any housework, the possible leisure to think or to create, and finally, the anonymity and privacy of a room of our own. Hotel life defined the freedom of the city, but such freedom has been for some reason suspect, and there are always those of us, those who want to police freedom. Finally, like the society that evoked, that evolved in our city, there have been, of course, hotels for those with money, and hotels for those of us with not so much money. And even though the city required our labor and allowed us cheap us housing in cheap hotels, in time we came to know that laboring people are necessary but considered transitory. Eventually it was thought we'd just go away or become invisible. So even if hotels depended on our constant occupancy, we were not considered permanent or stable members of society 
We did not own our homes. We may have had families, but hotels were suspect places to raise children. And so we were suspect families. Our communal lives in hotels with shared bathrooms and shared dining, shared genders, shared ethnicity, and heaven forbid, shared thinking that might lead to shared politics were also suspect. Hotel life might even be subversive. A famous scholar who studied our hotel life warned us that when there are no homes, there will be no nation. But what did he mean by home? And for that matter, what did he mean by nation? Mm -hmm. Okay. Hello, um, my name is Naomi Munavira. And I'm really honored to be on this panel. Thank you, Elnaz, for inviting me. Um, and I'm really glad you guys are all here sticking through to the bitter end of this festival um, and still here and packing the room. Um, my novel is called Island of a Thousand Mirrors. It's about the civil war in Sri Lanka that went on from 83 to 2009. So 26 years of a very long, brutal, terrible civil war um, between two ethnicities, the Tamils and the Sinhalese. Um, and what I'm trying to do in this novel is try to tell this story from a character of either side. So I have a young Sinhalese girl and I have a young Tamil girl. And the part that I'm going to read and talk about is the part um, told by the Tamil girl, which is set in the north of Sri Lanka in occupied territory where both the army and the tigers are battling over this land and really victimizing the people that live there. Um, so this is my character speaking. My sister Lakshmi was named for the goddess with the long and lovely eyes. Lakshmi, who provides all things material. A stream of golden coins pouring from her open palm. Whereas my little sister was named for the butter-skinned goddess of plenty, I was named for Saraswati, the serious-eyed and studious goddess of learning. When I complain to Amma, she only laughs and says, look how wisely we have named you. And it is true, because there is something in me that loves the glide of pages between my fingers, the stroke of my pencil across paper, the hush of the village classroom. Even now, I am studying for the teacher's certification. Next year, when I'm 17, I will take the exams, and one day, maybe I will be the village school teacher. But these are big, big dreams for someone living inside a war, so I don't speak of them often. Sometimes I get this breathless feeling that the war is a living creature, something huge with a pointed tongue and wicked claws. When the tanks rumble past in the far fields, I feel it breathe. When the air strikes start and the blood flows, I feel it lick its lips. I've grown up inside this war, so now I cannot imagine what it would be like to live outside it. When Amma and Appa tell stories of before, it is that world with plenty to eat and no airstrikes that is alien to me. What would it mean to live without the soldiers in their sandbag checkpoints, without the barbed wire, without the giant photos of martyred tigers? Thank you. Writers, those were pretty fantastic excerpts, and I appreciate the the, the send off. Uh, I lowered the prices on the seats in the front. There are three. Would anybody like to come sit down? <laughs> no, very cheap. Um, okay, so I picked up a couple of themes that I want to talk about. I have a lot of ideas about this, and I'm sure that you do too. But the first came from Carolina's. Uh, excerpt when she was introducing it and talked about the invisibility of the people who in a way are losing their place and I want to talk about what creates invisibility is it economic class is it color is it culture is it powerlessness is it being part of the revolving bottom and Carolina I'd like to start with you to talk about that invisibility in this in that setting or in the setting of you're an Oaklander right yeah, absolutely. or in the setting of Oakland and how Oakland's being kind of occupied right now, um, even at the farmer's market. But, yeah. <laughs> um, yes, I mean, there's, there's my experience as an Oaklander and then, and then this work as well. Um, so I could go in a lot of directions there. 
But I, as far as this work, I mean, I grew up Uruguayan, and um, I have paternal grandparents from Argentina, so that's another route for me. And I grew up not hearing from my parents of European, primarily, descent, um, almost at all about the communities of African descent that are part of this history. And certainly, when you think of Argentinians, I mean, how many of you, when you think of Argentina, what you think of, of Argentinians, think of black people? Afro-Argentinians are just incredibly invisible, and the fact that it, that 100, 120 years ago, Buenos Aires was one third black, is, says so much about the invisibility um, in the context of history of those communities. I mean, I think, mm -hmm. sorry? Oh, something else is going on. Um, and, and, you know, the same goes for, for example, in studying the dictatorship, the Uruguayan dictatorship um, from 1973 to 1985, uh, which I researched for my first novel. Um, it was only, you know, after a lot, a lot of digging that I came to see what some of the stories are about how the dictatorship specifically impacted people of African descent. In Uruguay, the country is 8% uh, black, so there's a significant re remaining and enduring population more than in Argentina today. Um, and, and their experiences have been less told in the mainstream. And I think that, that marginalization is a huge thing that contributes, whether that is economic marginalization, um, racial marginalization, queer, you know, kind of like a marginalized sexual identity. It just contributes so much to, to invisibility. As writers, I think, we see that in narratives, in the stories that get told, in the stories that are more dominant, in the books that are more likely to get review attention, I mean, all of these dynamics. And then within a city, that happens as well. I, I just went to live in Uruguay for a year and a half, um, working with my wife on a film about people of African descent in Uruguay, hence this piece about research and really thinking about these issues, and came back, and I felt like we, Rip and Winkle, isn't that the story? He's falling asleep. I felt like a year and a half away from Oakland, and I wasn't coming back to the same city. It's changed so much and so rapidly um, in the last two, three years, and I feel like I'm still kind of getting my grip on, on what it means for so many of our communities. And um, I'll, I'll kind of turn it over for others to speak a little bit more about it. Carolina said something important about invisibility, and I think it's about, um, about not having a voice, and also about uh, the fetishization of, of people of color um, and stereotyping that makes us believe that we know who these people are, or who they are, who those others are. And um, because there are assumptions, then those assumptions make us invisible. Mm -hmm. So I'll just say that. Great. Yeah. Um, I mean, what happened in Sri Lanka is very, it's sing, sort of singular, but of course also universal. Um, we had this very long war for 26 years, and for most of the time, for at least about 25 years of that war, the north and the east of the country were completely cut off. So I'm Sinhalese, I'm of the, actually the majority ethnicity, and I grew up in Nigeria and Los Angeles, which is a whole different story, um, and I won't go into that. Um, but I could have traveled more easily anywhere in the rest of the world than into the north of Sri Lanka, which was the active war zone. Um, so I did a tremendous amount of research, and I read everything I could, and I um, knew Colombo and the south of Sri Lanka quite intimately, but the part of this book, that is set in the north, I didn't have access to that um, area. And the cities there were active, under active bombardment. Um, and the really interesting thing is, so 2009, the war ends, and I went there as a teacher, and I was teaching a couple of writing courses there. And I'm Sinhalese, I'm of the majority ethnicity that had you know, won this war and there's still absolute heavy military occupation. It's like an occupation. There's like military everywhere. There's soldiers with guns. Um, uh, there's houses that are just bombed out and bullets splattered. And you know, my students are telling stories of like, how, how do you survive that many decades of war? Some really tremendously difficult, awful things. Um, and we were on a tour bus and we were sort of touring around and we would go to these places and what we realized is that the government at that time was 
rewriting history, basically. What they were doing is they were coming in, raising, raising um, Tam Hindu Tamil temples that are like thousands of years old and putting up Buddhist monuments because the Sinhalese are Buddhist. So basically they're like reclaiming this land and reclaiming the history. Um, in this just like, it's just painful, painful way because I'm actually Sinhalese Buddhist. So to see my tradition being used to ex just exterminate a culture, which is really like what was going on in the North of Sri Lanka. And I think it's a little bit better now, but it's still actively what's going on. And that's the absolute silencing um, of a people, you know, their history is being destroyed. And they're, and they're invisible, you know, they're not able to speak. I mean, I can speak because I'm American and I'm Sinhalese. Like, if I lived in Sri Lanka, I would not have written this book because I would have been killed. Um, journalists and writers disappear in Sri Lanka all the time. I have an American passport, I can write. When I'm there, you know, I get um, threats every now and then. Um, but if I was Tamil and I didn't have an American passport, I wouldn't write this book. So. One of the things, I, one of the threads I want to pull from this is the, the, the sense of rewriting history. And here we have people writing about, authors writing about these very potent times, whether it's the, the civil war of the country, the resettling of the country, or the, the, the war inside the city. When you wrote the books, what level of responsibility did you feel to fill in the parts of history that were not represented in? in not only the news, but in other kinds of works, in mainstream writing, either political writing or fiction and non-fictional -fiction, writing. What, what was kind of the load that you carried as a writer? Or was it just like, I'm going to write about this character and I'm not going to worry about it too much? So can, <laughs> <laughs> can someone pick up on that thread a little? You want to start cuddling? Because I laughed. Yes, because you laughed. That's your kind of thing. I just kind of can't imagine that writerly life. <laughs> and I think it, it, depending on the kind of work that you do, um, what you write about, I mean, for me, I, I feel a tremendous and profound responsibility. I mean, in the first book, I explore, you know, 90 years of Uruguayan history, not only the dictatorship, but certainly the dictatorship years and what it meant to return to democracy. And in my second novel, The Disappearances in Argentina, across the river in that other dictatorship, um, and, and the legacies of that. And these are real people and real experiences that I feel like I have to do my very best to uh, be of service to. And I personally am always most drawn to telling stories that have been historically marginalized, that are invisible. I mean, I mean, even with this, The Gods of Tango, like there are a lot of books in the world that have the word tango in the title. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed. And some of them have nothing to do with it, like Last Tango in Paris. It's just like Marlon Brando having sex with some young woman. OK, fine. And there's a little bit of tangoing in it. It's been appropriated so much. And it's always the woman with the flower in her hair. And it's highly gendered. And it's just the dance. And this is my attempt to kind of explode that and really go into the history, which is full of stories of displacement of black people in Buenos Aires that nobody even knows about, and like real, real invisible stories that I, I think that writers can have a very important role in making the invisible visible, in giving voice to that which has been made voiceless in society. I know that as a reader, books have given me so much entry into stories that otherwise would not be told or not be visible to me. I mean, the, the beautiful books that my amazing fellow panelists are talking about and reading from are incredible examples of that. I have so much to learn about the world as a reader through books, and I, I believe in books' as power to uh, refill the emptied well. Carolina, I'm... You know, who, the, the work of Eduardo Galliano, he, he so recently died, and I'll, oh, yes. I, I want to just uh, ask you about that. And um, I mean, I find his work incredibly passionate about, you know, bringing forth a different kind of history for us. Um, I don't know if you'd like to say anything about that. 
Eduardo. I, it, so Eduardo is my countryman. He's also Uruguayan. And it's, you know, I come from a country of three and a half million people. It's like a neighborhood of some cities. In fact, I was once on a panel with an Indian writer, and he said, 3.5 million. He's like, that's, I see that many people from my backyard in Bombay. You know? And so it's a small country, so we all have these very personal relationships to Galeano. You know, like, I know the part of the Rambla that he walked his dog on. And it's a very beloved figure. Open veins of Latin America is the classic. It's like a people's history of the United States of Howard Zinn for Latin America. And he has been an incredibly important voice all about, you know, giving voice to the margins and the voiceless and um, in a very bright and brilliant way. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, so I think the question was about like giving, trying to give voice to the voiceless, kind of something like that. Um, it's such a difficult and tenuous thing to get right because you don't, you can't speak for the entire country. I can't speak for all of Sri Lanka. I can't speak for all Tamil people or all Sinhalese people. But I think what I was trying to do is like I read everything I could. I researched as much as I could, and then. I really try to embody characters and explain like what would it feel like if you were in certain circumstances. So my in was really embodying the flesh as much as I could of certain characters. Um, and bec I mean, again, that trip that I'm talking about was just so mind blowing because when I went to the north and I'm sitting and talking to these people and they're like, telling me stories, it's almost like my characters have come to life and they're telling me and I'm like, oh my God, I didn't live through this, you did. I wrote about it because I have a certain amount of privilege and power and you don't, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's a tenuous thing and you gotta get it, it's like a huge responsibility to try and get it right and also not get buried under the question of am I authentic enough? Because that can just destroy you. You know, there's no one that's authentic enough, right? Like that doesn't exist, and if you have that question in your mind, you just won't write, um, you know, because every, there's always someone that's like, no, you didn't do that, you didn't live in the right place, you didn't live in the right city, whatever. Um, but I, rem I talked to this university professor from the city of Jaffna, and she was talking about how they kept the university open through 26 years of war, sometimes the classrooms were out in the open, and they would be typing their exam papers, on a rock, like on a typewriter on a rock, and then handing them out to the students, and the students would sit on a rock and like write the exams. And I'm like, oh my god, okay, that's what I'm trying to give voice to. Um, and at the same time, they were like, thank you for writing this book. Like, not many other people have gone there and done that, so it's, it's a difficult balance. Yeah. I guess I would say that this this book is a work of ten years of research. <laughs> Um, in archives and also with speaking with people of the period and the activists and the people who were involved in uh, the hotel and also in the Asian American movement. And um, f yeah, after you speak with that many people, um, over a hundred and something, um, you have an enormous responsibility to tell the story. And yet this is really, it was a, um, it was a, not an easy thing because um, there were activists from all sides of that movement, uh, from the very radical and the underground to, to people who were in politics at the time. And um, they were very protective of their stories. At the same time, they, they had difficult things to say about them. And, and to, sort, to sort all that out and also to give voice to their vision of what had happened, but um, and their disappointments, um, and their cynicism even after 30 years, um, it it was a balancing act, and um, you know I I have to say uh, it's my fault, <laughs> you know, um, it, and and it was my interpretation, but um, uh, I learned a great deal. You can only present the intersection that you have with the with the historical moment. So one of the things that brings me that brings me to and it's and and after we have this discussion, maybe we'll talk to the audience a little bit more. As most of you know, I write a lot about Lebanon and Palestine, and it's like um, you know very moving work, right? It's about occupation and war and all that kind of exciting stuff that we all write about. 
And then the question comes down to, as a writer, like, what difference does it make? The world's in flux, things are gonna trans transition, we're gonna have new people coming into the neighborhood, there are gonna be new economic and military aggressions. Um, is this a contribution in any way? So one of the, uh, it's kind of a self-doubt thing that kind of runs through my veins, but right now I'm writing a Survivor, the Lebanese Civil War story, and it's like, I look around the world and I see all my characters from different civil wars standing in line at Trader Joe's trying to normalize their life and here I'm raking all this stuff up, so what difference is it going to make? Have those questions for you as writers gone through your head about, you know, I'm doing all this work, I'm working really hard, is it going to make a difference? What am I doing? What are you doing? Um, can you not do it? Hell no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you knew the answer to that. But yeah. I, I mean, that's really the crux of it. I don't think I chose to write this particular book. It's going to sound ridiculous and weird and, you know, whatever. But, you know, the book came to me. I didn't choose it. It came to me and these characters said, you're going to write about us. Okay, I don't really want to, especially the more difficult parts of the book. But there is a certain sort of, I don't know, something in the blood that makes you do this. And does it make a difference or not? I don't know. I mean, if five people say they liked reading it and it meant something to them, that's a huge big deal. Mm -hmm. After 10 years of research, Karen, what do you think? <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Fair enough. Carolina? I have such a deep love for novels. I have such a deep love for poetry. I have such a deep love for books that I think one of the places I return to is my, my, the, my passion as a reader. Mm -hmm. So books really raised me in a lot of ways, saved me. The exposure to stories and, and other ways of being and other things in the world. Um, my, uh, I grew up in a very socially conservative family, extremely gendered. I was, was sort of controlling dynamics. And so I wasn't raised to be this, you know, like lesbian novelist you see before you. And so, and so, and so I think for me, books, I, I don't doubt the power of books in the world. Even though so many people would rather watch stuff on YouTube about Kim Kardashian than read literature and all of these things about the doomsday of, you know, it's the end of publishing. It's been that way apparently for a couple hundred years. And, I, and so I think that, um, yes, things are changing, yes, there's so much that we're up against in the world. There are many opportunities for despair, many real opportunities for despair. But there are also many real opportunities for inspiration and beauty. And I, I don't know that I believe in it because I believe in my own work, because that I'm not sure that I can always do. But I do believe in books themselves, kind of valuing art. And I also believe in the stories the value of the stories that I am attempting to do justice. And, and that's the piece. It's like these, these stories deserve voice, and, and I may or may not be the best conduit for it, but they're here, they're, they're deeply urgent to me, they're knocking on the door of my consciousness, and I'm going to do my darndest. All right, so I'd like to offer an opportunity for the audience to ask some briefly well phrased succinct questions <laughs> and uh, and we'll see what we go from there. Yes. I have a question. Good. Great panel. Um, I have a question for Naomi. So how was your book received by um, the Tamil community in the Bay Area or the Sinhalese community in the Bay Area? Was there a reaction from your family or or were, was it eye opening for people or did you get any I hope not threats from people here, or how, how did the book do? Um, so that's an interesting question, because most people say, how was it received in Sri Lanka? But this is a very interesting question, how was it received in the diaspora? Um, and I think the caveat to understand about the war in Sri Lanka it was completely funded by diaspora. So for both sides, we're sending back tremendous amounts of money, and that's why the war went on for 26 years and was incredibly well funded. If people in the diaspora did not send back money, that war would have ended in like three, four years. Um, so that's because people in the diaspora in London, Toronto, Australia, Los Angeles really had this idea of home and they wanted home. So they're like, we live here, but we want 
our home not to be taken by those other people. So the most vociferous criticism I got was from my own community, my own Sinhalese community that I grew up in Los Angeles. And they basically were like, well, you've written this pro-Tamil book. And I'm like, no, I haven't. It's actually pretty fair, I think. And there was a lot of like real anger around that. And then there were certain people, extended family, that were like, you shouldn't read it to other extended family. Um, and then one of the claims, there's an act of real violence that happens to one of the women in the book, um, which is if you're a woman in the course of war, you know, your body is going to be a battleground. That's just every war. And there was this claim that, well, that didn't happen in Sri Lanka, which is like, no, that's ridiculous. It happens in every war around the world. Like, women's bodies are used. Um, so that was a real, really annoying thing to have to deal with and be like, no, we are not exempt, you know? So, you know, we're not exempt from the rules of war. If there are women in warfare, whether they're fighting or not, their bodies are vulnerable. So, yeah. Another question, yes. Um, I, uh, when you talk about economic and military aggressions in our neighborhoods, it just really brought to my mind uh, the Black Lives Matter movement yeah. here in the U.S. And some of the most powerful images from uh, that, that movement are, are the black women, the women of color, stepping between the police and the crowds. Mm -hmm. um, just very powerful. And what mm -hmm. I'm curious is if you feel as women of color writers that you are stepping between a certain force in the world and the voices um, who are represented in your stories, that, that you're stepping in between that and you're, and you're kind of using that power to, to make that difference. Did everyone hear the question first? You all heard the question, okay, carry on. That's a beautiful way to put it. I, I don't know that, I'm, I feel like I'm just a writer, you know, and that this is the thing that I can do. I'm not, you know, I'm not a politician. I can't be, I can't get up and defend anyone in court. I'm, I'm pretty shy. Um, when I teach, I, I have to have notes. I, you know, it's, it's difficult to be in front of people. Um, so this is the way, yeah, maybe this is the way I put my words and in a sense, my body and my mind forward. But yes, well, thank you. Sometimes because of our subject matter, we're automatic, it's automatically assumed that we're activists. Like people ask me activist-based questions all the time. Do you get that, Karen, as yeah. well? Yeah. yeah, of course. Was that a signal? OK. <laughs> um, yes. I'd like to ask a question about um, amnesia uh, in, um, in cert certainly in areas that have gone through war uh, in the Middle East. I'm from uh, Lebanon, from Beirut, and I was brought up during the war. And but my recollections are very minimal because I was young. And when I uh, talk about it or ask people about it in Lebanon, at least uh, around me, there's always this uh, avoidance of the subject and the burial of it. And uh, how do you, uh, I, I think that's also why uh, in, you know, artists, writers are, are so important so that they can bring up, um, you know, they have the courage to bring up maybe these topics back to uh, you know, the, the conversation, the public conversation. So maybe you could talk more maybe also about uh, uh, that area and, and your, your other regions. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, Amnesia, yeah. People, Sri Lankans don't talk about the war. They're just starting to now because the war ended in 2009 and we have a new government now. Now they're starting to. So I was there in December, I was doing a book club and um, this woman got up and she started telling a story about how in 83 a mob came to her house and they um, took her uncle and shot him in front of the whole family. And then the widow and the kids went to England and they never talked about it. Everybody that was left never talked about it again. And she got up and she's telling this story and she's crying. We're all crying. And she's like, this is the first time I've talked about it. So there's absolute silence about it. And this is one of the ways, like now it's starting, people are starting to talk about it, but it's so traumatic because when you're living it in, in that kind of situation on a daily basis, 
you don't talk about it nonstop, right? You don't say, oh my God, I'm so traumatized, this is so terrible, I'm gonna die, my kids are gonna die. You cannot do that because you have to keep living. So there's a way in which it's really um, silenced and internalized. I would say also that events of trauma, my, my parents were incarcerated during the war for being Japanese American. And I would say that I grew up knowing nothing about it, except that I would see them get together with their friends and say, what camp were you in? And, and all of us, the kids thought they were, they went to summer camp together. <laughs> and that that was what had happened. And it wasn't until I was a teenager that I realized that my, the trauma that had happened to my family um, and it was silence for so many years because when the Japanese Americans came back to their neighborhoods, they had to reintegrate and they wanted to forget. And they were so ashamed of what had happened. So that's also part of what happens. It's not just amnesia, it's, it's a burying of the past so that you can get on with your lives. Yeah, I was just saying, it's coping. I mean, I think that there's, there, there's no right or wrong way to cope with trauma. But in a country, in the case of Uruguay, it wasn't a war, it was a dictatorship. But the dictatorship creates this, this atmosphere of repression where, I mean, I, people I've talked to, like, you can't breathe in that, you know? And even people, even the diaspora people who got out, I mean, it's only now that I fully understand the depth of trauma for my mother as an emigrant in Switzerland, which, contrary to what some people think, is an incredibly xenophobic, difficult place to be a foreigner, at least for our family. It was, we were othered, it was incredibly painful. And here she was getting calls from her family back in Uruguay, you're so lucky you got out. And she's kind of trapped between this hostile country that she's in and the country where you know, this kind of gloom has settled, where everyone's scared to speak to each other because anyone could be an informant. And you know, the country has healed a great deal. Pepe Mujica, our most recent president, you may have heard of him, the guy who drives the beat up BMW and gave um, the VW and gave 90% uh, of his salary to charity. Former guerrilla fighter, was in solitary, tortured and in solitary confinement for 13 years, and was then president of the country. I mean, it's like if a Black Panther became a president of the United States. I mean, it's a former Black Panther. I mean, it's that dramatic. And that was a very healing thing for the country. On the other hand, I recently talked to a woman um, in Uruguay who said, you know, my husband is a survivor of the imprisonment and torture under the dictatorship. And she said, you know, I turn off the TV anytime there's stuff on the dictatorship. And for her, it's like enough already with the public talk. We can't listen to the radio because he gets so traumatized. And there's no right or wrong way around that. I do think that when there can be storytelling, when a person is ready to voice or to approach a book that gives voice to the story, it can be a, a, a conduit for healing, not to be pushed on someone if it's not the time and space. But I've had people write to me about Perla, my second novel, which focuses on the disappearances and really moves into the, the torture and so forth. I've had people tell me it was healing for them from people from the Philippines, people from Middle Eastern countries, other South American countries, who'd had parallel experiences, um, not the same one, but for whom it was powerful to read the story about trauma and healing from it. So I think that literature can have a role. I'm not sure we even have a language to talk about this. One of the things that I do know is that according to the International Psychological Association, and you may be surprised to hear this, Lebanon is the most depressed country in the world. And the women are the most depressed of the population. And that was shocking to me, but it wasn't when I went to do the interviews because people didn't want to talk to me. They wanted to give me a political line. They wanted to say it was the Palestinians' fault, or it was Syria's fault, or it was Hezbollah's fault. And they wanted to spin the story so that it would always fulfill whatever that premise was. And so even my own cousins, of whom I have about a zillion, um, did, were not able to uncover the story, their, their own personal um, connections to the story. So yeah, thank you for that. Um, we, we're running out of time, so I, before, yes, three minutes. Three minutes. So um, instead of taking another question, I want to ask the panelists, do they have any final thoughts? that they would like to share. I know this was very, was this very quick for you? Yeah. It was very quick for us. Any final thoughts um, from the panel? You've been brilliant. Um, I think what we didn't touch on is what's going on in Oakland, right? Which we all are aware of. And Elmaz, you brought this up on Lakeshore. Uh, 
somebody got shot, they were sleeping in their car, is right, that right? Exactly. Um, and that's something that we should all be just incredibly aware of, and I wish we had had more time to go into what's happening, like in all our lives collectively here, and you know, that's an open question. Yeah. Any, any other uh, thoughts? Um, I w I'm sorry to say that, did we find books? Yes. Oh, talk, talk about books, right? Really. Since you all have lasted all the way to the end, the only bad side of it is a lot of the books are gone. So we have two books right outside the door that, are being, that can be autographed, uh, Anna Mae Wong by Karen and Amaz's book of poems. That's all we have left. I'm really sorry. But they are right there once you walk out the door. And we do have another group coming in in a few minutes, so we need to disperse, but you can sign up. I and by the books. You have what? I'm Oh, there we go. Excellent. All right. Thank you all for Thank coming. you, everybody. I appreciate it. Thank you, Pamela.